John 7, 37 through 52. This is the word of the Lord. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said to, about the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit has not been given, because Jesus has not been glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one had laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered, have you also been deceived? Have, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But the crowd, do, the, but the crowd that does not know that the law, uh, know the law is accused. Nicodemus, who has gone before him, who has gone to him before, and who is one of them, said to them, "Does our law judge the man without give, without first giving him a hearing and learning from what he does?" They replied, Are you from the prophet arises from Galilee? May God bless the reading of his word. Today's text for our ser- for the sermon is John chapter seven, verses thirty seven through fifty two, which is what was just read. If you haven't turned in your Bible there yet, I invite you to do so. Today I titled our, the message, Thirsty, Come and Drink. Have you ever been thirsty? Maybe you were out in the sun doing yard work. You're supposed to be out there for an hour, maybe two, and it stretched on to three, four, or five, and you kept thinking, I'm almost done. I'm just going to hang out out here a little longer. Then I'll go get some water. Then I'll go get something to drink. But hour upon hour, you got more and more thirsty. Or maybe you got lost on a hike. You brought a little bottle of water. After all, you're only going short ways. And before you knew it, the only thing on your mind was getting back to the car so you could get back to where There is water. I'm sure all of us have been thirsty before. I can remember as a a young child playing outside, we lived in the country and there were over 100 acres of, of land we had available to play on. Trees and rolling hills and and no fences, well, at least no fences an eight or nine year old boy couldn't defeat. And no water. Hours of playing building forts, running around, searching for bears in the foothill. It's not a smart thing to do. <laughs> Finally getting so thirsty that you just have to go back. I remember going up to the barn, even though the barn was only about 25 yards from the house, turning on that hose, waiting for that hot, nasty water to get out of the hose first, and then finally taking a drink of cool, refreshing water. Have you ever been thirsty? Today, from our text, we're going to be looking at three points. The first point is that spiritual thirst is only satisfied by believing in Jesus. Our second point is that we are to not rely on our own knowledge. And by doing so, miss the water. And last, our lives can demonstrate or distract from the living water. Before we jump into our text, though, there needs to be a little bit of background. 
Throughout chapter 7 of the book of John, we have Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus has, has gone up. He's already had a midweek dust-up with the, the Pharisees and the crowd. And now we've gotten to the last and greatest day. But I don't know how many of you know anything about the Feast of Tabernacles. When was the last time you guys went to a Feast of Tabernacle celebration? All right, if you haven't gone, highly recommend it. But this is something that the Jewish people, they've been doing for hundreds of years. It was prescribed by God in the book of Exodus. It had been happening for years and years. Every day during the seven-day feast, the priest would get a, a pitcher and would lead a procession from the temple down to the pool of Siloam where they would scoop up water and then lead the procession back into the temple. And as the procession approached the water gate, the gate in the inner court of the temple, the shofar, the, the ram's horn, would be blasted three times, a sign of a joyous occasion. And then, while the pilgrims and the people who attended watched, the priests would proceed around the altar carrying this pitcher as the temple choir sang out the halal, Psalm 113 all the way through Psalm 118. I bet you guys are kind of glad we didn't have you do that today, huh? When the choir would reach Psalm 118, every male pilgrim would hold up a willow and palm branch in his right hand. In his left hand, he would hold a citrus fruit. And they would raise him up, showing thanks and praise to God for the ingathering, for the, the harvest that he has provided. As they reached toward the temple in Psalm 118, The choir would be singing, starting Psalm 117, Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify him, all people. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let Israel say, his faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his faithful love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his faithful love endures forever. Then all the people would cry out three times, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. At this point, the priest who is holding that water would dump it into a silver dish on the altar. And then he would offer the water with the daily drink offering of wine before the sacrifice. Those bowls were then poured across the altar. See, these ceremonies, the ceremonies of the Feast of Tabernacles, they were related to what the Lord had done for them when God rescued them from Egypt. The people were supposed to remember how God provided. How he provided water in the wilderness. Isaiah 44 says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring." To the pouring of the water at the Feast of Tabernacles, it referred symbolically to the Messianic Age, to the promised Messiah who was to come, from which a stream of water would flow and cover the whole earth. In Ezekiel 47, the prophet Ezekiel talks about this. Ezekiel talks about how 
an angel brought him to the temple and how there was water flowing from, from under the, the altar of the temple. And throughout Ezekiel's account of this, the angel led him a third of a mile and measured the water, and Ezekiel said, it came up to my ankles. Then another third to my knees, and another third, and another, another, until it got to the point where he said, I could no longer cross the water on foot. In verse 8, the angel said to him, the water flows out of the eastern region, and then it enters the sea, and there the sea water even becomes fresh. Every kind of living creature that swarms will live wherever the water flows. And there will be huge numbers of fish because the water goes there. Fishermen will stand beside it. This will become a place where they spread their nets out to dry. Each month, the trees along the river will bear fresh fruit and the water, because the water that comes down from the sanctuary. This was a passage that would have been read during the Feast of Tabernacle, reminding them there is a promised age to come. Yes, God provided for us in the wilderness, but don't miss out on the promise that one day, one day from the temple, streams of water that give life will flow. See, people believed that when the Messiah would come, he would provide water just as Moses had. Joel 3.18 says, All the streams of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will issue from the Lord's house. So this water-pouring ceremony, which had been happening, it wasn't prescribed by God, but it had been happening for hundreds of years, was remembering what God had done and looking forward to the promise that he would send the Messiah and pour out his spirit. For six days, the people had done this. And now it's the seventh day, the last and greatest day of the feast. The day when, for those who should have been there the other six days but couldn't make it, they made sure they were there on that day. The streets were packed. The procession was going down out of the temple to collect the water. The shofar had sounded. The people were praising God. They're lifting up their shouts of hallelujah. And then Jesus cries out. Last week we talked about what that word means. We talked about how this is only used of Jesus here in the book of John. Not even when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Abba, Father, is this word used. This cried out word is, is a yell to get people's attention. You need people to pay attention. He did it in the passage we talked about last week. And here in verse 38, he cries out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of, of living water flow from deep within him. Now the crowd is quiet. Some of the people are quietly passing along the message they heard Jesus say. And I'm sure there was some murmuring. What is this that Jesus is talking about? What just happened? The first point today talks about how spiritual thirst is only satisfied through believing in Jesus. I want us to notice three things from what Jesus said here. First, Jesus invited anyone who is thirsty to come to him. These words no doubt carry a spiritual meaning. The thirst that Jesus is talking about, he wasn't they're like, hey, I've, I've got some bottles of water. They've been on ice all day. I know you guys are thirsty. You're just saying Psalm 113 through 118. Come, get some water. No. Jesus was talking about the spirit which was going to be, going to be poured out. The thirst before us today is, is purely a spiritual kind. Jesus is asking the people, have you had enough 
of chasing the legalistic doctrines that the rabbis are teaching and then walking away still thirsty. You focus on your works, but still your thirst is not quenched. You keep coming back over and over and over again only to leave thirsty. If you've ever wondered why you are anxious and longing after peace of conscience. Think about this. When a man feels his sins, the want and forgiveness of his soul and need, when he earnestly desires for help and relief, that's what Jesus is talking about here. That is the state of mind which Jesus had in view when he said, if anyone is thirsty. And how do we feel that thirst? When you come back from a, a long hike with not enough water or those hours of time in the hot sun doing yard work, some are tempted to reach for a can of soda, maybe a glass of lemonade or some sweet tea. And if that's you, then I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you've never really been thirsty. When people are, are dying of thirst, they will accept any liquid to drink that they ask for water. They ask for water. I mean, it's how our bodies were made. When we are dehydrated, our body cries out for water. And here we have that in this text. The people were spiritually dehydrated. And they kept coming back to the temple, hoping that on that day, they would finally walk away quenched. People will seek many ways to fill that, that spiritual thirst. Even convincing themselves that, that what they are drinking is what their body needs. But what we need is water. And that's what Jesus, offer, Jesus is offering here. Jesus is letting the people know that he is what will satisfy their thirst. But how? Jesus says, let him come to me and drink. He declares that he is the true fountain of life, the supplier of all spiritual necessities, the reliever of all spiritual wants. And he invites all who are heavy laden, who are burdened with sin, to come and believe in him. These words, let him come to me, they are few and simple. But they settle a big question that all the wisdom from the world could never settle. They show how man can have peace with God. They show that, that peace is had in Christ by trusting in him as our mediator and our substitute. In one word, by believing. To come to Christ is to believe in him. To believe on him is to come. The remedy may seem like a very simple one, even too simple to be true. But there's no other remedy for our thirst than this. In general terms, then, Jesus' pronouncement is clear. He is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. What they've been anticipating for hundreds and hundreds of years is fulfilled in him. Isaiah, in Isaiah 55, 1, invited the thirsty to come and drink, those without money to come and be filled. He said, Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water. And here, Jesus announces that he is the one who provides that water. The one who believes in me will have streams of living water that flow up from deep inside of him. I'm sure that John's readers would have thought back to the Samaritan woman. Remember, she was sitting there at the well, 
And Jesus had promised her that whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water that I give will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. A promise is given to us in verse 38. And it's that promise I want us to really remember. If we believe, if we come to Jesus and we put our faith in him, we will have streams of water that flow from deep within us. Have you ever thought about that? This promise has two applications for us. It teaches that all who come to Christ by faith shall find in him abundant satisfaction. In my mind, I, I see kids, when you tell them they can have a soda or something, they fill the cup, one cup of soda, fill it all the way to the top, and it just rounds over at the top, and they're like, I cannot possibly get any more in here. You know, that's not what God does. God isn't like, oh, you want living water? There you go. That's all I can fit in that cup. He just keeps dumping and dumping, and it overflows. It's in Christ, by faith, that we shall have that abundant satisfaction. In John 10, Jesus tells the people that he came so that they can have life and have it in abundance and have life overflowing so they will never thirst again. But it also teaches that believers will not only have enough water for their own souls, but they will become fountains of blessings to others. This truth can be testified to by believers across the ages. And it's as true now as it was 2,000 years ago. I love how J.C. Ryle talked about this in his commentary on John. He said, when they came to Christ by faith, talking about the people over the last 2,000 years, when they came to Christ by faith, they found in him more than they expected. They have tasted peace and hope and comfort since they first believed, which, with all of their doubts and fears, they would not exchange for anything in this world. They have, they have found grace according to their need and strength according to their days. In themselves, he said, and in their own hearts, they have often been disappointed. But they have never been disappointed in Christ. John tells us in verse 39 that what Jesus is promising was to those who believe in him, they would have the Holy Spirit indwell them. Did you realize that? When you place your faith in Christ, you are not only indwelled with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit flows out of you. What does that look like? What does that look like? Paul tells us in Galatians 5 what the fruit of the Spirit is. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So I want to challenge each of you this week, examine yourselves and see if you have the fruit of the Spirit flowing from deep within you. I don't want you to be like, like the Dead Sea having all the glory and the wonder of God being poured into you, and you're just doing everything you can to keep it to yourself. We're not to hold on to the abundance that God gives, but we are to let it flow out. And that is how we will have the abundant and overflowing life that Christ promises. Which leads us to our second point in verses 40 through 44. Do not rely on your own knowledge and miss the water. You see, the people's response to Jesus' statement shows us some important things we need to keep in mind. After Jesus made the statement, division broke out among the crowd, which, if you've read the book of John, you see this happen often. It happened actually like a dozen verses ago. Jesus spoke, and the people were divided. They argued about whether Jesus was the promised prophet or if he was the Messiah. You know, something that they had never thought of? They never thought that maybe, maybe those two roles could be filled in one person. 
but they didn't realize that Jesus was both and more. He was the prophet, the priest, the king. He was the Messiah, and he was fulfilling all of the prophecies. This is something that the people had never thought that one man could do. I think we fall into that trap as well. I think we often will will take Jesus and we'll be like, okay, this is what you can do in my life, but I've got to get something else for this and that and the other. Jesus, I I understand that you're going to save me, but I need to do, I need this guru over here and I need this motivational speaker here and I need, and we try to find different people to fill the roles that, well, Jesus just can't fill. We get trapped in that idea that Jesus is not enough for everything. We'll often say that he's enough for some things, for the important things, but not enough for everything. Again, this argument is centered around here in in John uh, 7, 40 through 44. This argument is centered around if Jesus was born in the right place. Was he of the right lineage? Do we downplay who Jesus is? I think many people are fine making him a prophet, one who had cool sayings and good life lessons, a knack for filling people's stomachs with bread and fish. Many, like some of the people in that crowd that day, were ready to buy the book and eat the bread, but not ready to believe in him. And so while many rejected him because he thought they thought he wasn't from the right town, other people, they did believe. As I was reading through this passage, I, I thought about something. Jesus could have fixed all of this. I mean, I know that people didn't have Google. So they kind of just like Google Jesus' birthplace. Okay, yeah, we got it. But we know from John 6, 42, that at least some of the people in the crowds knew who Jesus' family was. So they ever crossed their mind, like, hey, maybe we should ask around? Like, hey, we know Jesus lives in Galilee. Where is he born, though? A few questions could have cleared it all up. And why didn't Jesus simply... Set the record straight. Why didn't you just tell them, listen, you guys keep arguing about this. I'm from Bethlehem. I was born there. Here's my birth certificate. Why didn't he just do this so he could demonstrate his eligibility to be the Messiah? You see, throughout the gospel, we, have, we see repeatedly that communication, it's not the core problem to why people do not believe. It's not a communication issue. It's a heart issue. In John 3, 19 through 21, it tells us that even though the light had come into the world, there were some who, because their deeds were evil, loved darkness more than light. But Jesus continued to promise that those who live by truth will come to the light. You see, it's the openness of one's heart to God's truth that demonstrates whether someone is going to reject or accept the facts about Jesus. Is the person seeking God? Have they humbled themselves, as James 4 says? Are they seeking truth, or are they seeking confirmation for what they want to be true? While these people were yet again arguing about birthplaces and ancestry, they failed to become familiar with the man standing right there in front of them. See, I think we need to be careful that this doesn't happen to us as well. We have to be careful that we do not seek information so much that we fail to spend time at the throne of grace. We need to ensure that we sit daily at the feet of Jesus that we humbly learn from him because this is the highest degree of knowledge which a mortal man can have. It's when we rely on our 
our own knowledge, that we often miss those streams of living water. And a close examination of the harsh, harsh words that the chief priests and Pharisees have to say in verses 45 through 52 show that their blindness is rooted in smug pride, in the conviction that their privileged position has guaranteed them spiritual wisdom. Which leads us to our third point. That our lives can demonstrate or distract from the living water. The temple police have made their way back to the chief priests and Pharisees empty-handed. They had their orders when they left. Go, arrest Jesus, and bring him back to us. But now they come back without him. I've, I've been a, in charge of people before. When I was in the army, if I told the, the privates below me to go do something, I expected them to do it. The Pharisees and the chief priests had that same expectation. You are to go and get Jesus and bring him back to us. I can only imagine that in the past few days since they were dispatched on this task, that they said, okay, we can't just grab him in the middle of the crowd because he has a large following and we're a smaller group of people. We're going to have to kind of watch. We're going to have to figure out where in, when is the best time to get him. So for the past few days, they must have been tracking him, sitting on the outskirts, listening to him teach, watching as he interacted with his disciples and with the people who came to him for healing. I'm sure they started off the mindset that at the, at the key time, they would arrest him and drag him back to face trial. But the longer they staked him out, the more they heard him teach, the more they listened and the closer they watched him, the more they believed. Look at verse 46 with me. Why didn't you bring him? The religious, leader, religious leaders asked. Their response is telling. No man has ever spoke like this. In a biting whip, the Pharisees try to point out that none of the rulers, none of the Pharisees had believed in him, just the ignorant crowd. It's just the, the unlearned hillbillies from the sticks. But the difference is stark, isn't it? What the Pharisees did not realize is that they had just proven Jesus' point. When people listen to the words of Christ, it rings true. Have the leaders listened to Jesus? Have they weighed his words and sought to understand? They too could have believed. But they had their preconceived ideas about the Messiah and had ruled Jesus out from the beginning. But Nicodemus, who John points out was the one who had, who had come to, to Jesus by night in chapter 3, speaks up. Doesn't our law... Our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him or knows what he is doing, does it? The second time that Nicodemus is mentioned in the gospel, he'll be mentioned one more time. In chapter 19, when after Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus brings a mixture of, of myrrh and aloe and anoints Christ's body as they entomb him with the assistance of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus' disciples had fled, but Nicodemus was there. We see here in this account of Nicodemus, hope. We see that there is always hope. We remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus in the cover of night. And that darkness in in John chapter 3, yes, there was a physical darkness, but there's also a spiritual darkness. We see throughout Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus how 
how Nicodemus is so confused. How he couldn't grasp the spiritual things that Jesus was saying. He was a guarded man. Not wanting to step away from his position of power, of leadership. But now, now we have Nicodemus here speaking up. He, he just heard what the other Pharisees had to say. See any religious leaders? Any Pharisees who believe in him? Ah, it's just the, just the uneducated people, and they're going to be accursed for believing in him. But he speaks up and defends Christ. He doesn't let their pointed, barbed accusation to the, soul, to the temple police affect him. The other Pharisees throw a barbed comment at him too. You aren't from Galilee too, are you? Insinuating that, hey, you're, you're sounding like one of his people. You're sounding like you may be a, a disciple of this Jesus. The way we live matters. The way we live matters because it demonstrates or distracts from the message of the gospel, from the, from the living water that should be flowing. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you live in an area, in a country where it's illegal to be a Christian. If the police were tailing you, if they were bugging your house, watching how you lived, would they come back and say, you know, we've been following this person for weeks. I don't think they're a Christian. Let's move on to someone else. Or would they return saying, I've seen how this person lives. I, I see how they speak. It's clear. They are a disciple of Jesus. You see, the, the temple police listened and learned from Jesus and came back saying, no man has ever spoken like this. Nicodemus met with Jesus and listened to him, and his words and actions made other people believe that he too was a follower of Christ. What about you? What about me? Does your life, is your life a demonstration of what it means to have drank from the living water? Or does your life look no different than that of an unbeliever? Would anyone accuse you of being from Galilee too? We can go through the motions. We can sing the songs. But if we don't come to Jesus, if we don't believe in Jesus, then we will never be made right with God. Because salvation comes only by placing our faith in Jesus, by believing in him. I want to encourage us today that we should not just go through the motions and think that, that we can find another way to quench the spiritual thirst that we have. We don't want to continue going from one to another to another when the living water is being offered in Christ. on the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus steps forward. He says, I am the fulfillment of the prophecies, the living water that you seek. Come, come to me, all you who are thirsty, come. Because if you believe in me, 
the living water, the Holy Spirit, will be given to you, will, be, will indwell you, and then streams of living water will flow from you as well. Let's not just go through the motions today and think that we can find another way. In Amos chapter 5, God tells us something about how he views it when we just go through the, through the emotions. When we are, we are in the presence of the word, but we just put on an act. Amos 5 says, regarding this, God said, I hate, I despise your feasts. I cannot stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offered me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship, for the fellowship offering of fatted calves. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. I want us to remember that we can go through the motions, but it's not going to please God. If we do not come to him in faith, if we do not believe in him, not him and something else, if we do not come to him in faith, God won't accept it. There's but one way to be right with God. And Jesus told us this in John 10. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. As we close our service, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to examine your hearts, to examine your lives. Maybe today you want to come forward and, and pray. I'm going to be up here at the front. Maybe today you realize you've been going through the motions, but it's all been an act. You want those streams of living water to flow from deep within you. You are tired of being thirsty. You're tired of of looking and looking and looking and never being satisfied. But today, today you want to walk away with those streams of living water flowing from deep within you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the time you've given us today. We thank you, God, for your word preserved for us. And Lord, as we respond in worship and song, I pray, God, that you will work on our hearts. That those who believe, Lord, you will convict us of sins so that we can, can allow the living water, the fruit of the Spirit, to flow from us even greater. Lord, we want our lives to be a demonstration of what it means to have our thirst quenched, what it means to be satisfied in you. But God, I know there are people here who, who may not believe. God, let this be the day. Let this be the day that they recognize that there is but one way to fill that spiritual thirst. And it's by putting their faith in you. Lord, let us wholly give our lives to you. Let us seek after you. Because if we seek you, Lord, you promise you will be found. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.